I think we take power hitting first baseman for granted. Take a guess at how many first basemen you think hit more than 30 home runs in the 2023 season. You got your number? Here's the answer. Four. It's four. That's it. I certainly thought it was more, and I think the general psyche of the average baseball fan is the reason why. First basemen are expected to be sluggers with ease, pumping out absurd power numbers because that's the role that they fill. It's why I think many exceptional seasons from first basemen in years past get tossed by the wayside. Paul Konerko, Richie Sexton, Adam LaRoche, these are just a few examples of guys who won't ever be Hall of Famers or remembered as well as the greatest players of their era, but they all did their job. They scooped bad throws at first base and mashed balls over the fence with regularity. The thing is, their peaks and the peaks of first basemen that are better than them pale in comparison to the man who I consider to be the most forgotten power hitting first baseman maybe of all time. It was only for a brief moment in baseball time, but at one point in the mid 2000s, you could make a compelling argument that Travis Hafner was the best hitter in Major League Baseball. You may scoff at that or consider it revisionist history, but it's true. The peak of this Cleveland slugger simply out does some of the most prolific hitters in recent baseball history, and yet his peak remains largely forgotten. So today, let's do it some justice. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure you leave a like on the video, and if you want to, subscribe to the Jolly Olive channel. I'm getting really close to hitting 100,000 and I could really use your help, so I'd appreciate it. Travis Hafner was amazingly discovered deep in the depths of the 1996 MLB draft, selected in the 31st round with the 923rd overall pick. Shockingly, he wasn't the latest drafted pick from that year's selection to turn into a solid big leaguer, with Marcus Giles being scooped up way deeper in the 53rd round. Going by his affiliate ball numbers, it's pretty perplexing to see Hafner get picked so late in the draft. His plate discipline was always there, and by his third minor league season, he was putting up 20 home run campaigns with OPS numbers well into the 900s, all the way through AAA. In 2002, he got his first cup of coffee with the Texas Rangers, putting up mostly mediocre numbers in parts of 23 games. But Texas decided to use his potential in the trade market, being that he was blocked by the likes of Mark Teixeira and Rafael Palmeiro. They found a suitor in the Cleveland Indians. Texas received catcher Aynar Diaz and starting pitcher Ryan Drees, who combined for 4.0 B-War in their time with the Rangers. Hafner would put up 5 B-War alone in his first full season with Cleveland, totaling 25 War by the end of his playing days there. From the outset, this looks like a lopsided trade, but it makes a lot more sense when you consider the context of both franchises. The Texas Rangers were about to lose their former MVP catcher Pudge to free agency, so they were trying to find his successor in this trade. And on the other side, Cleveland was about to lose Jim Tomei to Philadelphia in free agency, so they were looking for their next power hitter. Obviously, one side came out a little bit better than the other. Hafner started the 2003 season with Cleveland, but struggled mightily in his first 30 games of the season, barely eclipsing the Mendoza line. He was sent down to AAA for more fine-tuning and resurfaced with the club in mid-July, where he looked like a totally new guy. From his call-up to the end of the season, he clubbed 10 home runs in 60 games with an 881 OPS and even hit for the cycle. It became clear that Cleveland had something special on their hands in the 26-year-old power hitter. Coming out of spring training the following year, Hafner won the starting designated hitter job. And it was around this time that Travis Hafner developed his unique nickname of Pronk. The textbook definition of Pronk, which is a real word in fact, reads as follows. Leap in the air with an arched back and stiff legs, typically as a form of display or when threatened. That's not why he was nicknamed Pronk, and this is also not a dictionary, this is some Yankees book. His teammate Bill Selby combined his two nicknames that already existed. One of them was Project because he was a well-regarded prospect when he got closer to the major league level, and the other one was Donkey because when you watch Travis Hafner run around the bases, he kind of looks like a donkey. Thus, the nickname Pronk was born. In his first real shot at sustained playing time in 2004, Hafner capitalized on the opportunity in a big way. He eclipsed the 100 RBI plateau and clubbed 28 home runs, with his OPS sitting just a couple hairs under the illustrious 1,000 mark. He ranked in the top five of the American League for on-base percentage and slugging percentage, and only Manny Ramirez had a better OPS than his 993 mark. Despite all of these accolades, his relatively unknown name and position of DH meant he didn't get a ton of recognition and MVP voting, mustering just one 
ninth place vote on a single ballot. This unfortunately would become a trend during the peak of his playing days, but we'll get to that. His team's performance didn't help either. The Cleveland Indians went just 80 and 82 in a disappointing campaign, despite improving by a dozen wins from the year prior. They were just a game behind the first place Minnesota Twins as late as August 14th, before tumbling through an ugly 10 game losing streak that sent them back down to 500, where they never resurfaced. Still, 2005 brought new hope and another monster season for their new slugger. Cleveland wisely recognized the breakout of their designated hitter and inked him to a three year extension worth just $6.75 million. Travis Hafner responded with more crooked numbers at the plate. He improved upon his slash line from a season prior by placing third in the American League for on base percentage and slugging, once again finishing with the second best OPS in the league at 1.003. This time, he only trailed Alex Rodriguez, who would go on to win the MVP award. Unlike the 2004 season, Hafner began receiving widespread recognition as one of the best hitters in the game, placing fifth in American League MVP voting compared to his finishing place of 24th from the year prior. With the addition of Kevin Millwood and breakout seasons from Cliff Lee and Grady Sizemore, Cleveland continued their steady upwards trajectory with a 93-win season. However, this somehow wasn't even enough for the AL wildcard spot as the Indians finished as the best team to miss that year's playoffs, watching their rival Chicago White Sox win the World Series. In their late season push for the playoffs, Travis Hafner smashed 11 home runs in the month of September alone as Cleveland wrapped up consecutive 19-win months, all for naught. And to twist the knife even further, Cleveland is the only team to win 93 games in a season and not make the playoffs and it's happened to them twice. It happened again in 2019, and I did a whole video on how good that team was. But while Cleveland fans stewed with the sting of that 2005 disappointment, they had no idea the kind of season they were about to witness from their first baseman slugger in the upcoming year. But before we get to that, let's take a quick detour. The 2006 MVP race was weird in both leagues. In the National League, it's widely considered to be one of the most stacked position player classes ever. Six different guys hit over 40 home runs. Jason Bay finished with over 30 home runs, 100 RBIs, and 100 walks, and he got one 10th place vote. Alfonso Soriano, who accomplished just the fourth 40-40 season ever in baseball history, finished in sixth place. The leader in slugging percentage, OPS, and war, Albert Pujols, finished runner-up. The winner, Ryan Howard, probably deserved it, but it doesn't change how absurd this race was. Over in the American League, it was a similarly wide open field, but kind of in the opposite direction. The war leader was a pitcher, Johan Santana. Last year's winner, Alex Rodriguez, finished in 13th place. 38-year-old Frank Thomas finished fourth after not receiving a single MVP vote in the two years prior. In the end, it became a narrow race between Derek Jeter and Justin Morneau, with the latter coming out on top as one of the most peculiar winners in baseball history. The thing is, I wouldn't have put either of those guys in the top two of my own ballot. This was a race destined for the two best designated hitters in the game at the time, which were David Ortiz and Travis Hafner. Travis Hafner got off to an absolutely ludicrous start to this season, homering seven times in his first 11 games of the year. He ended up walking more times than he struck out in each of the first three months of the season, with an OPS over 1,000 in each of those months as well. Amazingly, after ending the first half with a league leading 1.112 OPS, more walks than punch outs, and 25 home runs in just 83 games, Travis Hafner didn't even make the all-star team. Somehow, Hafner didn't make the all-star team in any of the years of his peak. I think the right to vote is super important, but I think we should take it away from baseball fans because we just never seem to get all-star voting right. He responded in kind by putting up the most impressive month of his career in August later on, clubbing 13 home runs in 28 games and slugging an absolutely alien 8.56 slugging clip, good for a 1.339 OPS. That mark in a single month has only been matched or surpassed 52 times in the past 60 years of play and has only been done 11 times since Pronk did so. But coming off the heels of his best career month, the rest of Hafner's MVP caliber season was robbed from us when CJ Wilson broke his hand on a hit by pitch. And his season abruptly. Hafner, who finished the season with 129 games played, was likely snubbed from serious MVP consideration due to his untimely injury. But when you look at this season in a vacuum, it's one of the greatest of the modern era. Hafner remains the last Cleveland player with 40 home runs in a single season, a list of just seven men in their franchise's history that includes Jim Tome, Manny Ramirez, and Albert Bell. This contributed to Hafner's 181 OPS+, plus, which led every major league hitter in 2006 and still stands as one of the best marks in MLB history. It's only been done a dozen times in the near 20 years since his 2006 season. In the end, Hafner finished a disappointing eighth place in MVP 
voting, a massive underselling of how dominant he was at the dish during 2006's season. As I mentioned prior, I'm of the belief that Travis Hafner and David Ortiz were the most deserving candidates out of the American League this season, neither of whom took home an MVP award during their respective careers. The two of them placed top five in wins above replacement despite not playing the field. Across the entire player list, they were the most well-rounded candidates in my opinion, placing first or top three in almost every major category. David Ortiz led the league in home runs and was second in slugging percentage, while Travis Hafner led the league in on-base percentage, slugging, OPS, weighted runs created plus, and was still top three in Fangraph's war. If not for missing that last month, Travis Hafner might have won the MVP award and would be a far more peculiar winner than Justin Morneau ever was. Despite going without much recognition, this 2006 season concluded the peak of Travis Hafner. Of players with at least a thousand plate appearances from 2004 to 2006, Travis Hafner only trailed Albert Pujols and Barry Bonds in OPS Plus, with his mark of 170 placing third amongst all hitters. This ranked better than the likes of Manny Ramirez, David Ortiz, Miguel Cabrera, and Alex Rodriguez for reference. The astonishing thing about this three-year peak where we supposedly got the healthiest and strongest version of Travis Hafner is that he still had a concussion, a broken hand and broken toe, and elbow surgery all in this window. And he was still putting up video game numbers. He rightfully earned himself a four-year, $57 million extension in mid-2007, the most lucrative contract in Cleveland's history to that point. Though he played the full extent of the season that year, playing 152 games with 24 home runs and a 120 OPS+, plus, it was obvious that Hafner was not 100% the year following his MVP caliber campaign, but he was clutched down the stretch with a 965 OPS in September as Cleveland finally made it back to the playoffs. He even got his signature postseason moment with a walk-off single in the now infamous Midges game in ALDS Game 2 against the Yankees. But this would be the last time that Hafner was truly 100% healthy or productive in his career. A handful of injuries and ailments meant he'd only surpass 100 games played in a season just once during the next five years of his career with the Indians. His numbers in this window, including a cumulative 117 OPS plus, were admittedly solid, but weren't as desirable considering how much time he had to miss. At the tail end of the deal, Cleveland decided not to exercise his option on the deal, allowing Pronk to hit free agency and leave his home. His one-year deal with the Yankees in 2013 got off to a roaring start with a 1.104 OPS in his first month in pinstripes, but a rotator cuff injury plagued the rest of his season and what would become his final year as a big leaguer. Looking back on it now, it's truly amazing to break down the numbers and see how close Travis Hafner was to the pinnacle of power hitters in the 2000s. Not many can say that they reached the top of their game for a three-year stretch, and though Travis Hafner's name is widely forgotten outside of the city of Cleveland and die-hard Statner and baseball fans like you and me, he deserves his due, and hopefully this video can serve as a testament to just how dominant Pronk was when he was healthy. Anyways, that'll do it for me today. If you enjoyed today's video, why don't you leave a like on it and maybe subscribe to the Jolly Olive channel. We're getting really close to hitting 100,000 subscribers, and I'd appreciate every sub I can get. If you want to help me out, it'd go a long way. Before you go, let's hear a word from today's sponsor, the DraftKings Sportsbook. Thank you to the DraftKings Sportsbook for sponsoring today's video. Right now, if you download their app and use promo code OLIVE, you can bet $5 and win $150 in bonus bets instantly. Now, I know there's not a lot of baseball to bet on right now, but there's plenty of other sports that you can get in on the action for at the DraftKings Sportsbook, like NFL Football Sundays or some basketball action as well. You can combine multiple bets for a same-day parlay if you're watching all the games on Sunday and you have a shot at a huge payday. And even if sports betting is not yet available in your state, you can still get in on the Fun with DraftKings Daily Fantasy. There's a lot to do on their app. It's free. It's easy to use. So download it right now and get started in your sports betting career by using my promo code OLIVE. Bet $5, win $150 in bonus bets. It's very simple. It's a great offer and it's around at the DraftKings Sportsbook. Thank you to them for sponsoring today's video. Now I'll see you guys next time.